In House of the Dragon, Episode 3, the king kills a stag, the princess kills a boar, and the prince kills a crab feeder. There's a battle and a party, and no one has fun except for this pug. So what happens and what does it mean? This video has no spoilers beyond Hot D Episode 3. The episode starts about three years after the previous episode. King Viserys has married Alicent Hightower, they've had a baby named Aegon, and Alicent is pregnant with another child. To celebrate Aegon's second birthday, they hold a royal hunt. We saw a royal hunt in the original Game of Thrones show, and Thrones author George Martin said this was his least favourite scene in the entire show. Cause this hunt is just four dudes walking in the woods. When George said that a royal hunt should be a big event with a hundred dudes, and tents, and dogs, and horns. So the hunt in Hot D is much closer to the author's vision, with tents, and dogs, and horns. They hunt in the Kingswood, which is a forest near King's Landing where only the king is allowed to hunt animals. Last episode mentioned a poacher who was brought to justice for the crime of hunting here. So the hunt is like a big festival with lots of food and guests. Viserys wants everyone to just have fun and celebrate together, but the lords have political agendas. Hobart Hightower is the Lord of Oldtown, and he's the older brother of Otto Hightower, the Hand of the King. The Hightowers want King Viserys to make Alicent Hightower's son, Aegon, heir to the throne, instead of Rhaenyra, who Viserys earlier named as heir. Cause if Otto's grandson becomes the king, that could make the Hightowers more powerful. Previously, it seemed like Otto was motivated by his own ambition. But now we see Hobart pressuring him and telling him what to do. Last episode, Corliss talked about second sons, how younger brothers are overshadowed by their older brother and have to fight for a place in the world. We see that dynamic in Hobart and Otto, as well as in Corliss and Vaymond, and in Viserys and Daemon. Lots of brother stuff this episode. We meet Jason Lannister and his twin brother, Tyland Lannister. These guys are ancestors of Cersei, Jaime, and Tyrion Lannister. Jason is the Lord of Casterly Rock, and Tyland is now on Viserys' council as Master of Ships to replace Corlys. The books say that Viserys chose Tyland to be Master of Ships because the Lannisters supported Viserys back at the Harrenhal Council. Jason and Tyland are both played by actor Jefferson Hall, who once played Sir Hugh in Game of Thrones Season 1. You might not remember Sir Hugh, cause he didn't last very long. Lord Lionel Strong brings his sons, Laris and Harwin. Harwin is said to be the strongest knight in the realm, and has the nickname Breakbones. Laris is called the Clubfoot because he has a deformed foot and has trouble walking. So instead of joining the hunt, Laris sits with the ladies and listens quietly. The official website says Laris is ingenious, but underestimated. The name Laris sounds like Varus, and Varus is also a man who listens and knows the value of information. Princess Rhaenyra reads in the Godswood, making a minstrel play the same song over and over like an iPod on repeat. The minstrel's name is Samwell, which might be a reference to Casablanca, when a musician called Sam has to keep playing the same song. Rhaenyra's song and Rhaenyra's book are about Nymeria, the ancient eastern princess who sailed across the sea to escape the Dragon Lords. Like Nymeria, Rhaenyra dreams of freedom and escape. In episode 1, we saw Rhaenyra and Alicent here when they were best friends. But now Rhaenyra is cold and distant to Alicent. She still feels angry and betrayed that her friend suddenly became her stepmom and her queen. Rhaenyra tells the minstrel to stay, but Alicent tells him to leave, and the minstrel obeys Alicent, not Rhaenyra, cause Queen Alicent now outranks Princess Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra hates that she's been replaced by Alicent, so she refuses Alicent's attempts to reconnect. On the road, Alicent says that her baby's birth was quick and easy, and then there's an awkward pause, cause everyone's reminded of Rhaenyra's mum, Emma, who died in childbirth in episode 1. At the hunting camp, everyone cheers for baby Aegon. 
Aegon's granduncle, Herbert Hightower, calls Aegon second of his name and his grace, which is what you would say if Aegon was king, even though officially Rhaenyra is heir to the throne. Many lords want a male ruler, not a woman. So while everyone cheers Aegon, Rhaenyra sits alone and ignored. We hear that Lady Johanna Swan was abducted in the Stepstones, because the Stepstones are currently occupied by the Triarchy, the Eastern Alliance led by the Crab Feeder. The books say that the Triarchy impose heavy taxes on ships passing through the Stepstones' trade routes, and they don't just take money. The Triarchy kidnap people and sell them into sex slavery in the city of Lys. Johanna Swan was the 15-year-old niece of a lord, and after being kidnapped, she became a famous courtesan in Lys, and eventually was the ruler of the city, known as the Black Swan. We meet Kira Lannister, the mother of Jason and Tyland, and we meet Lady Jocelyn of House Redwine, an ancestor of the Queen of Thorns. Jocelyn criticises King Viserys, so Rhaenyra insults Jocelyn. Which is funny, but it's probably not smart. If Rhaenyra wants to rule, she needs allies, and insulting powerful people is not gonna help. Despite being heir to the throne, Rhaenyra isn't acting like a politician, she's more like a grumpy teenager. While Alicent acts more diplomatically, she behaves like a queen. Jason Lannister tries to flirt with Rhaenyra, because Rhaenyra is now of an age to be married, and as a royal princess, everyone wants her. Jason tries to impress Rhaenyra by bragging about his wealth. The Lannisters are the second richest family in the realm, after the Valerions. Jason says that he's got a really big penis, I mean a really big castle. Castly Rock is taller than the Hightower, and taller than the Wall. In the books, it's like a mountain with tunnels and rooms carved all through it. Though when we saw Castly Rock in Game of Thrones, it was not as impressive. Jason says that he could build a dragon pit, so if Rhaenyra marries him, she could keep dragons at Castly Rock. And this is not the first time that Lannisters have tried to get dragons. The old King Jaehaerys had a sister called Rhaena. Rhaena and her dragon Dreamfire stayed with the Lannisters for a while, and the Lannisters tried to convince Rhaena to give the Lannisters dragon eggs, or to marry a Lannister so that their children could have dragons. Because with dragon riders of their own, the Lannisters could become as powerful as the Targaryens. Many of the great houses were kings before the Targaryens took over, so all the proud lords are envious of Targaryen dragon power. Rhaenyra is angry that Viserys wants to marry her off. She doesn't want to be sent away to live with some husband, and she doesn't want Viserys to disinherit her and give the throne to Aegon instead. Viserys handles his unhappy daughter by shouting at her in a public political event, which is a terrible idea. So Rhaenyra rides away, like Princess Nymeria fleeing the Dragon Lords. Otto says there's been a sighting of a white heart a deer with a rare pale colour. In Westeros and in real mythology, a white heart is seen as a rare blessing from the gods and a symbol of royalty. If they catch this white heart on baby Aegon's birthday, it could be seen as a sign that Aegon should be the heir to the throne. Otto admits that he doesn't normally believe in signs and portents, but he will pretend to believe any old crap if it means that his grandson becomes king. Jason Lannister gives Viserys a fancy spear to honour Aegon. Gifts are a way to try to win political favours from kings. Jason mentions the Golden Gallery, which is a place in Casterly Rock with gilded ornaments and walls. It sounds like the Palace of Versailles or some place. Jason says that he expects Aegon to become heir instead of Rhaenyra, so Viserys drunkenly shit-talks and teases the Lannister to put him in his place. Like how King Robert drunkenly made fun of Lancel Lannister in Game of Thrones. King Robert and King Viserys are both charismatic characters who really suck at being king and use alcohol to cope while terrible conflicts brew around them. Otto tells Viserys that he should marry Rhaenyra to Aegon. Viserys laughs at the absurdity of marrying his daughter to her two-year-old half-brother. 
but the age gap between Rhaenyra and Aegon is less than the gap between Viserys and his wife Alicent. And the Targaryens have a long tradition of marrying their siblings. Viserys' parents were siblings, and his grandparents were siblings. So since Rhaenyra and Aegon are only half-siblings, this would be one of the less incestuous Targaryen royal marriages. Marrying a Targaryen would prevent other families from potentially getting dragons, and a Rhaenyra-Aegon marriage could prevent any potential conflict between the two for the throne. But Viserys is sick of the fucking politicking and returns to his wine. The king is surrounded by people, but is very alone and stressed. Viserys is now missing two fingers, because his finger was cut on the throne in episode 1 and was rotting in episode 2. Now the infected fingers have been amputated. The king is literally falling apart, disintegrating under the weight of his crown. Lionel Strong says that Viserys is not the first Targaryen king to have trouble with his daughter. The previous king, Jaehaerys, had constant problems with his daughters. Alyssa was a wild tomboy, Daella was a scaredy cat, Sarah ran off to a brothel, and Viserys was a narcissist. Lionel says that rebellious Targaryen girls are tradition. Of course, if every generation of Targaryen women struggle against the political system, that might be a sign that it's the system that's the problem, not the women. But they discuss a husband for Rhaenyra, and Viserys expects Lionel to say that Rhaenyra should marry his son Harwin. But it turns out that Lionel is the one guy who doesn't recommend his own family's interests. Lionel says that Rhaenyra should marry Laenor Valerion. Laenor is the son of Corlys Valerion and Rhaenys Targaryen. He's the heir to the rich house Valerion. Marrying Laenor could finally fix the tension between the Targaryens and Valerions. After Viserys rejected Laenor Valerion and Rhaenys was rejected at the Harrenhal Council. Viserys seems to appreciate that Lionel gives unbiased advice, but he also is too wasted to walk in a straight line. So Rhaenyra runs off into the woods, and she's followed by her sworn protector, Kristen Cole. Rhaenyra and Kristen have become close over the last few years. Rhaenyra complains about being married off, about not having a choice and being powerless. But Kristen reminds her that she's a princess, and her life is way better than most people's lives in this medieval world. And Rhaenyra is not powerless. By choosing Kristen for the Kingsguard, Rhaenyra changed Kristen's life for the better. As a lower class person, Kristen can give Rhaenyra the perspective of someone less privileged than her. Rhaenyra insists on hanging in the woods instead of returning to camp, and they get attacked by a boar. Kristen wounds the animal, and then Rhaenyra brutally stabs it to death, unleashing her emotions through violence. Rhaenyra is full of suppressed anger at her father, and pain from Alicent's betrayal, so she lets it all out on this animal. Rhaenyra said earlier that dying boars squeal like children, and then the child Aegon made a squealing sound. So now, when Rhaenyra kills this squealing boar, maybe she's imagining stabbing Aegon, the baby that threatens to replace her as heir. Viserys tells Alicent about his dreams. Many Targaryens have prophetic dreams of the future. Like Daenys Targaryen dreamed about the doom of Valyria before it happened, and that's how the Targaryens escaped the doom and came to Westeros. Daenys wrote a book of her visions called Signs and Portents, which is the same phrase that Otto uses to describe the White Heart. We know that Viserys once dreamed that he would have a son, and that son would be king. But when Emma and her son died, Viserys lost faith in this dream. He gave up on having a son, and that's why he named Rhaenyra as heir instead. But now that Viserys finally has a son, Aegon, he's doubting himself again. Maybe his dream of a son was right after all, and Aegon should be the heir, not Rhaenyra. The White Heart is part of his doubt. If they find the White Heart on Aegon's birthday, that sign might convince Viserys that Aegon should be the heir. So Viserys is full of doubt and guilt and grief, which is similar to other Targaryen dreamers. In the Hedge Knight novella, Daeron Targaryen feels tortured by his dreams, and he uses alcohol to try to escape them into a dreamless sleep. 
Daeron's brother, Amon, says that dreams killed his brothers, every one. Alicent looks concerned that her husband and king is drunkenly rambling about using dreams to decide the future of the realm and of her son. In the morning, they find a deer, but it's not the White Hart, it's just a normal brown deer. So Viserys feels relieved. There was no special omen on Aegon's birthday, so maybe Viserys made the right choice after all, and Rhaenyra should be the heir. Viserys is expected to kill this deer, even though he didn't hunt it down himself, and he doesn't really want to kill it. This moment is similar to how Viserys had his wife Emma killed. She also was held down and helpless, sacrificed reluctantly by Viserys. This is the job of a king, to sacrifice people for the good of the realm, soldiers in battle, women in childbirth. But Viserys' compassion makes him reluctant to make these sacrifices, and that's why it's hard for him to be king. Viserys fails to kill the deer cleanly and has to stab it twice, which is another bad omen. It's like when Theon struggles to kill Roderick in Game of Thrones. This execution is ugly and farcical and makes everyone look bad. The deer can also represent King Viserys himself, because the deer is a strong, regal animal, but it's also constrained, struggling, pulled in different directions by these men, just as Viserys is pulled in different directions by his lords and their politics. In Game of Thrones Episode 1, a dead stag foreshadows the death of King Robert, who was killed by a boar. So this dead stag could be foreshadowing for Viserys. Meanwhile, Rhaenyra is covered in the blood of her violence. Her killing was not some fake ceremonial slaughter, it was real hot-blooded violence to defend herself from an attack. And as she looks over the Kingswood, the White Heart appears to her just walks right up like some mystical sign from the gods that Rhaenyra should be the heir. Criston draws his sword, but Rhaenyra tells him not to kill the heart. This shows that Rhaenyra can be merciful and peaceful, in contrast to her killing of the boar. Not killing the white heart also fits with the animal's mythology. In the Game of Thrones books, Sansa thinks that in the stories, knights never harm white hearts. So Rhaenyra plays the role of the noble heroes in the stories. But if Rhaenyra did kill the White Hart and showed everyone back at camp, that might have convinced people to support her as heir. Her choice not to kill the Hart could represent Rhaenyra choosing not to go for the throne. So just like all the dreams and prophecies, this mystical sign is ambiguous. It's up to the characters and the viewers to decide what this sign means. Rhaenyra brings the boar back to camp, so she still gets to prove herself to everyone. Jason Lannister is grossed out by the blood, but Harwin Strong is visibly into it. Back at the Red Keep, Otto speaks with his daughter, Alicent. They're quite formal and distant with each other. Otto calls Alicent Your Grace, which suggests that Otto sees Alicent more as a political figure than as his daughter. Otto says that her son Aegon will inherit the throne, because he's male. Alicent insists that Rhaenyra is the heir, but Otto tells her to convince Viserys to name Aegon as the new heir. Alicent speaks with Viserys and tells him that Rhaenyra will marry if she thinks it's her choice to marry. Which sounds a little manipulative, but it also shows that Alicent understands Rhaenyra's feelings, and wants her to be happy. Alicent learns that the war in the Stepstones is going badly. Viserys doesn't want to help Daemon and Corlys because Daemon and Corlys started this war against Viserys' wishes, and he doesn't want to look weak. But Alicent says that Viserys should do what's best for the realm, regardless of his personal feelings, which is what a king should do. And Alicent doesn't bring up making Aegon heir like Otto told her to. So Alicent isn't just going along with her father's plots, she advocates for the greater good instead. Maybe Alicent is a good queen. This is the first episode where we don't see Alicent picking at her fingernails. She has now become more confident. But her exact goals and plans are not yet clear. Viserys listens to Alicent and sends reinforcements to help Daemon and the Valerions. Viserys and Rhaenyra argue some more about Rhaenyra getting married. 
Viserys admits that he married Alicent out of selfish desire, not political advantage. So he says he'll let Rhaenyra choose who she wants to marry, and Viserys swears that he won't replace Rhaenyra as heir. So Viserys affirms his support for Rhaenyra privately, but many of the lords don't know that and still see Aegon as the heir. And if Rhaenyra marries for desire instead of for political advantage, she might not have the support she needs to claim the throne when Viserys dies. While the royalty are plotting and feasting, on the Stepstones, men are fighting for their lives. The Valerions and Prince Daemon are at war against the Triarchy, led by the Crab Feeder, and the war is going badly for the Westerosi. We see Daemon attacking the Triarchy with his dragon Caraxes, but the Triarchy learn to avoid the dragons by hiding in caves. These guerrilla tactics are similar to how the Dornish successfully resisted Aegon's dragons. We see Daemon's dragons stomp on one of his own men, which shows that Daemon doesn't really care who he kills, and shows that dragons are not precise weapons. When dragons go to war, there's collateral damage, and ordinary people get killed. Daemon gets shot with an arrow, and his dragon Caraxes cries out as though in pain. The books say that there's a mysterious bond between dragon and dragon rider, like some psychic connection that lets dragons feel what their riders feel. In the books, the Starks and their direwolves have a similar connection. So Daemon and Caraxes cause some havoc, but they fail to find the crab feeder. The Valerions are led by Lord Corlys Valerion. We also meet Corlys's younger brother, Vaemond Valerion, a commander in their navy. Vaemond seems to have a combative relationship with his brother, like Viserys and Daemon, and Hobart and Otto. Laenor Valerion is the son of Corlys and Rhaenys. He seems to have had a big growth spurt since we saw him in episode 1. And this guy is Sir Joffrey Lonmouth. He's called the Knight of Kisses, because the heraldry of House Lonmouth has red lips on it. The Valerions are outnumbered, they're running out of food, and they fear they'll soon be eaten by crabs. But then Daemon finds out that his brother Viserys sent reinforcements to help them, which you would think would be good news. But Daemon gets so angry that he beats up the messenger. Because as Viserys said, Daemon would rather die than accept help from his big brother. Daemon is here to prove himself, to show that he can win by his own strength. So before Viserys' reinforcements arrive, Daemon leads a suicidally dangerous attack. The plan is for Daemon to lure the crab feeder out of his caves. So Daemon goes alone, and he pretends to surrender by waving a white flag, only to betray the Triarchy and attack them anyway. It's like in Game of Thrones when Ramsay gets Theon to use a peace banner to get some ironborn to surrender, but then Ramsay betrays the ironborn and kills them anyway. This is another example of Daemon breaking rules to get what he wants. Daemon single-handedly kills like a dozen dudes, dodges arrows, does a barrel roll, and somehow doesn't die. And just when he seems doomed, he's saved by Laenor Valerion on his dragon, Sea Smoke. So they didn't mention it till now, but Laenor has a dragon, because Laenor has Targaryen dragon blood through his mother, Rhaenys Targaryen. Rhaenys herself also has a dragon called Melis, the Red Queen. The other dragon riders currently are Rhaenyra with the yellow dragon Cyrax and Daemon with the red dragon Caraxes. There are also a bunch of other dragons around that currently don't have riders, like Vermithor, the Bronze Fury, which was the dragon of the old king Jaehaerys. Silverwing was the dragon of Jaehaerys' wife Alysanne. Dreamfire was Raina Targaryen's dragon, and Vagar is on the east coast somewhere. Plus there are probably a bunch more hatchlings and eggs on Dragonstone. We'll see many more dragons later in this story. Sea Smoke is a silvery grey dragon, and he's a young dragon, fast and nimble in flight. He and Laenor burn the Triarchy from the sky, while the Valerions attack on the ground, led by Lord Corlys and by Vaemond. Daemon goes after the crab feeder and finally kills the crab. In the book, Daemon cuts off the crab feeder's head, but in the show he butchers him off screen. 
Daemon gets covered in the crab feeder's blood, which might be a bad idea, because according to behind the scenes info, the crab feeder had grayscale, a disease that can be highly contagious and deadly. So is Daemon gonna get infected and turn into a stone man? In the Game of Thrones show, grayscale can be cured. Jorah Mormont and Shireen Baratheon are both cured of grayscale. But in the books, it's different. The books say that there are different forms of grayscale. The swift grey plague is deadly, but there's a different form of the disease that affects children. It gives them stony grey skin, but it doesn't kill, and it's not contagious. So maybe Crab Feeder had a form of grayscale that isn't contagious, so Daemon is safe. There's also an idea in the books that Targaryens are immune to diseases, that the blood of the dragon has a purifying fire that saves Targaryens from getting sick. Daenerys Targaryen believes this, and she never gets sick, even when she visits disease victims in the books. But some other Targaryens do die of disease. King Daeron Targaryen II and his grandkids die of a plague, and Maegel Targaryen dies of grayscale. So not all Targaryens are immune to disease, but maybe some are. There are hints that it's only Targaryens who have dragons who don't get sick. King Daeron and Maegel don't have dragons, but Daenerys and Daemon do, so maybe Daemon is immune to disease. That said, Crabfeeder's grayscale is not in the books, it's never actually mentioned in this show, and it sounds like the showrunners just added it to make the Crabfeeder look scary. The point is that Daemon's reckless violence wins him victory, and his blood-soaked killing is similar to Rhaenyra's violence with the boar. While King Viserys awkwardly slaughters a defenseless deer, Rhaenyra and Daemon win real victories against real enemies. The showrunners say that these characters are reborn, finding new strength and purpose, forged stronger by fire and blood. If you want to know more about when the Lannisters tried to get dragons from Rhaena Targaryen, or about King Jaehaerys' rebellious daughters, the full story is told in Fire and Blood. You can get Fire and Blood on audiobook for free right now at audible.com ASX. Sign up for a Premium Plus trial membership and you can get an audiobook to keep even if you cancel the trial. You can get any Game of Thrones book or Lord of the Rings or Dune. Membership also includes unlimited access to thousands of audiobooks and shows in the Audible Plus catalogue. Sign up at audible.com slash ASX or text ASX to 500 500. Thanks for watching, please like and subscribe. You might also like to sign up to the Alt Shift X audio feed, where you can get all of these videos as podcast episodes, so you can listen on Spotify or your podcast app. Thank you to the patrons, including Dr. Falter, Broski Bakes, Zoe Cerullo, Kayo Alves, Kyle Brigman, and Rogue Prince. Cheers.